Hi, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us today. My name is Spagme Ahmed. My pronouns are she, her, and I will be your moderator for today. I am a global policy advocate with the International Center for Research on Women, or ICRW, and the North America Organizing Partner for the Women's Major Group. I'd like to first thank the Women's Environment and Development Organization, or we do, and Fundación para Estudio y Investigación de la Mujer for co-sponsoring today's event alongside ICRW and the Women's Major Group. And I'm really excited to kick off our conversation for today since it's one that I've been hoping to have for some time now. So today's event is titled Gender and Sustainable Development in North America, Ensuring an Equitable Recovery from COVID-19. We have a lot to cover today from the Sustainable Development Goals and the ongoing high-level political forum on sustainable development to outcomes from the recently held Generation Equality Forum and a range of gender issues at multiple levels of implementation. If you have questions throughout the conversation, please feel free to throw them in the chat and our team will collect them as we go along. And of course, tweet along with the women's major group hashtag feminists want system change. So I'll start by introducing my really incredible panelists for today. I'm very lucky to be joined by Penny Abewardina, Commissioner for International Affairs at New York City, Verena Winder, Senior Advisor in the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the U.S. Department of State, Mara Dolan, Program and Advocacy Associate at the Women's Environment and Development Organization, Beth Roniak, Policy Lead at the Equality Fund, and lastly, Megan Doherty, Director of Global Policy and Advocacy at Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights. So before I get into the panel discussion, I wanted to offer a bit of background on the Women's Major Group for any audience member who may be unfamiliar with who we are and what we do. So the Women's Major Group was formed in 1992 at the Earth Summit in Rio de Janeiro, Brazil, and since then has facilitated women's active participation in all UN sustainable development processes, including the HLPF. There are currently seven organizing partners for the Women's Major Group, including myself as the North America Organizing Partner. So in this capacity, I get the privilege of serving as an information hub, a resource, and an organizer for any group in this region interested in gender and sustainable development processes. I also want to be clear that while this event and my title are, are named North America, this region for the Women's Major Group covers only the US and Canada as our neighbors and Fellow advocates in Mexico coordinate their participation with the Women's Major Group through the Latin America and Caribbean Organizing Partner. So for that reason, today's conversation focuses on the US and Canada, but of course we welcome any perspective and participation across the continent for those interested in expanding the scope of our collaboration and thinking. So holding the floor for a little bit longer, I want to contextualize today's conversation a little bit before I pass the mic to my colleagues. As we all know, the US and Canada are key players in sustainable development processes, particularly given these countries' relationship with the Global South. So today's event is bringing together civil society and government representatives from across the US and Canada to discuss advancement and implementation of the 2030 Agenda locally, domestically, regionally, and internationally. We'll highlight a few of the SDGs that are under review at this year's HLPF, but overall we'll aim to focus on a holistic implementation of the 2030 agenda and to centralize human rights, gender equality, and the removal of systemic barriers to achieving the SDGs. So outlining two objectives that I have for today's discussion, first is to talk about sustainable development in North America. We'll discuss how the US and Canada are linking global and domestic implementation of the SDGs and what recent steps these countries have taken to advance human rights and gender equality at home. And secondly, to discuss the role of the US and Canada in global sustainable development processes as a whole. So in any conversation about the global north, we have to talk about power, we have to talk about history, and we have to talk about responsibility. The US and Canada are uniquely situated in multilateral spaces and their existence carries a lot of weight and influence. So as part of this discussion and hopefully the many that follow, I want us to think deeply about how these countries can challenge their positionality to reflect on the power imbalances they contribute to and really how to be effective, equitable, and considerate partners in advancing sustainable development, both domestically and internationally. And of course, we'll have to talk about the COVID-19 pandemic and the undue and additional burdens it has placed on women and girls worldwide, 
particularly Black, Indigenous, and women of color, and communities in the US, Canada, and globally that were already marginalized and facing multiple and intersecting forms of discrimination. So with that, I'm gonna finally get to today's panelists and I want to direct my first question to Verena. Verena, as you're very well familiar, the Generation Equality Forum just wrapped up earlier this month and we saw many governments, civil society organizations and other stakeholders making commitments to advance gender equality over the next several years. We saw the US make many commitments and several of these were actually focused domestically. So what does this mean for the US and its efforts to bridge its domestic and foreign policy as related to gender issues? Um, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. Um, thank you so much, Slagme, for, for the question. Thank you to all four organizers for, for organizing this panel today. I think it's really important to have a really specific conversation on goal five, even or goal five and how it relates to all of these other goals, especially when it's not specifically under review. So thank you for that. And I'm just really excited to be um, on this panel with uh, so many esteemed speakers. I'm especially really pleased to be, um, oftentimes I think we bring the US perspective just from the federal side, um, not necessarily from our cities, which are really just the engines um, for the federal side. So I'm especially really um, excited um, to, to hear Penny uh, from you today and, and from all of you. So um, uh, as Fagma mentioned, I am Verena Winder. I am the senior advisor in the Secretary's Office of Global Women's Issues at the U.S. Department of State. And so I do have the happy um, position of, of noting that um, back in March, of course, uh, President Biden signed Executive Order 10420, um, reaffirming the U.S. commitment to rights and empowerment of women and girls at home and around the globe. And so this EO, as we, we call it sort of shorthand here, lays out a comprehensive government-wide approach to advancing gender equity and equality with a series of elements that have already had a bearing on both our US foreign and domestic policy efforts. So um, from my position where I sit at the State Department and um, I've re-entered this position as a political appointee, but previously served for a number of years, about seven years as a civil servant, I'm seeing this sort of new focus play out in three, three critical ways. So first, there is this new coordinating infrastructure that is helping us to bridge the foreign and domestic. So the EO established the White House Gender Policy Council, which is of course a White House level office that's coordinating across our domestic and international efforts. So really importantly coordinating, not just with our federal agencies, of course, US State Department being one of them, but our national economic, domestic policy and national security councils. And so having this coordinating body and frankly, the, the, the daily conversations, the meetings, the brainstormings, the do outs, um, that has been a huge step forward and really demonstrates our recognition that the US has both strengths to bring um, and some lessons to learn in, in all of our engagements. And so, and I would say maybe secondly, what this coordination means, it's not coordination for coordination's sake. You're seeing that really already pay off in the kinds of commitments um, that we can make when it's an all hands on deck approach. So Spagma, you asked about GEF. Uh, the US participation in the GEF was one of the Biden-Harris's, Biden-Harris administration's um, first and early opportunities to reassert some global leadership on gender equity, along with, of course, all of the global gender champions who really made sure that the GEF happened. Um, and, and the GEF's efforts to build irreversible global momentum in this especially critical moment is I think consistent with this administration's commitment to gender equity and equality. So I won't delve into sort of the specifics of our commitments that is available in a fact sheet. Um, I'm happy to share that if that's of interest, but I do wanna highlight sort of the three areas of prioritization. And these are three areas that we see as critical linchpins across domestic and, and foreign policy. So these are preventing and responding to gender-based violence, um, focusing on SRHR, really critical, um, and economic security and rights. This again represents understanding of both our domestic and international federal agency partners, that we must work in concert, that we must work in a coordinated way, um, and that we must, uh, I think, build on the conversations, because a lot of conversations were had leading up to the GEF, to 
work closely together, learn from each other, and, and frankly, push each other um, as well. So when you put coordination and commitment together, getting to sort of the third, the third prong here, you also get representation, um, which I think helps to build, the, to build sort of a more propulsive momentum, both internal to the US government and external. Um, so Vice President Kamala Harris, of course, led the GEF US delegation virtually. Um, and we also have representation from both of our co-chairs from the White House Gender Policy Council, John Klein and Ambassador Reynoso, as well as um, US, US UN Ambassador Thomas Greenfield, um, USA Administrator Power, Secretary for Health and Human Services, Becerra. And what you get out of, out of that are, are a series of remarks that I think really tell you where the administration's head is at and on a lot of these issues. So Vice President Harris's remarks both at CSW, frankly, and during GEF, linked democracy with gender equality, linked it with, gen with the status of, the, the status of democracy is the status of women and girls. Um, and that really bridges the divide on this huge, big pink elephant in the room that, that is both our domestic and our global priority, um, which is of course the strengthening of democracy itself. Importantly, I think she ended her remarks with a specific call to action for, for the world's youth um, a universal message here at home and abroad. And really is just that we all know we have work to do, uh, both in our country, of course, and elsewhere. And this administration is rolling up its sleeves on both the left and the right hand. Um, thank you so much, Verena. A really helpful framing that you've provided around coordination and laying out the thematic issue areas that the administration is interested in. And as an advocate, I can also say that it's really exciting to see a lot of these policies put in place. Um, so I wanna shift the conversation a little bit and get more into the details. So thank you, Verena, for highlighting SDG 5 on gender equality, which for us, of course, is key to integrate across all of the sustainable development goals. But I wanna focus a little bit on some of the SDGs that are also under review at this year's HLPF and lead into the panelists that I have today. So first I'll make my way to Megan. Um, Megan, this year SDG 3 on good health and well-being is also under review and one of its targets includes ensuring universal access to sexual and reproductive health care services. So I want to ask specifically about Canada. What steps is Canada taking to advance sexual and reproductive health and rights domestically and how can it do better? Thanks, Bob Ray. Um, and before I get started, I just wanted to give a brief introduction to Action Canada for Sexual Health and Rights. And we are a nonprofit organization in Canada that works at the national level and at the global level to advocate for the advancement of sexual and reproductive rights for all. And within Canada, we operate a, a 24 hour access line that um, and it's it's across the country and and this access line people call looking for services and we connect them to sexual and reproductive health services in their area. But this access line also gives us a window into what are some of the barriers and what are some of the experiences of people trying to access um, anything from abortion services to information on sexuality to STI testing and, and the lot. So for this, in response to your, your question here, um, I, I'm drawing heavily on, on my colleagues who uh, have shared sort of some overarching trends that they have experienced uh, on the line that can hopefully provide a bit of insight um, to your question. Um, and so when we think of Canada on the surface, it appears to be doing very well in terms of sexual and reproductive health and rights. Abortion has been decriminalized here for almost 30 years. We have a system of universal health care that is fully entrenched into our national identity. We have a charter of rights and freedoms that guarantees non-discrimination and equal protection under the law. And we have a federal government right now that identifies itself as feminist and as a champion of sexual and reproductive rights around the world. But when we dig a little deeper, and as COVID has really shown us in stark terms, we see that things are not quite so rosy and that access to sexual and reproductive health and rights is characterized by inequality and inequity for many people. This is coupled with insufficient and diffused accountability mechanisms, because as, as many will know, we, are, uh, we have a federal system 
um, where each of the provinces are responsible for um, the delivery of healthcare services. And, um, but what we see is that um, with the different jurisdictions that those accountability mechanisms tend to be uh, diffused and as I said, insufficient, and they don't take into account the material conditions that are necessary for people to claim their sexual and reproductive rights. So if we use uh, access to abortion as an example, um, most surgical abortions in Canada are only available in urban centers. And for people living outside of these urban centers, they have to travel long distances, cover the cost of food, accommodation, bus or plane tickets, arrange for childcare, elder care, take time off work or school. At the best of times, it's almost impossible for many people living on low incomes, young people, people with mental health challenges, people living with addictions, and people with precarious immigration status. And when COVID hit, abortion was designated as an essential service, but access to the service was pretty much shut off for people living outside of these urban centers. The rolling lockdowns that prohibited travel outside of your community, we have closures of schools and daycares, flights and hotels were being canceled without notice, people lost their jobs. We had different bus routes um, that, that were outright canceled uh, throughout COVID, um, and not to mention the risk of contracting COVID to travel. And all that meant that access to surgical abortion was limited to those who had the means and the support to navigate this constantly changing situation. And as many abortion providers are, uh, they also provide other sexual health services, a knock-on effect uh, of the need to rationalize services, PPE, and healthcare workers was that STI testing and treatment was sever severely curtailed. And it hasn't yet fully recovered to its previous levels, uh, which were already insufficient to meet the demand. And this is particularly concerning as people are starting to socialize more as restrictions are being lifted. These services are not returning to pre-pandemic levels yet. On the more positive side, COVID restrictions, they fast-tracked the implementation of telehealth consultations, which has improved access to medical abortion. And it's demonstrated that people are very capable of self-managing medical abortion when that's the preferred option and it's within the gestational limits of early pregnancy. However, for a variety of reasons, medical abortion is not an option for everyone and addressing the root causes of inequitable access to surgical abortions has to be a priority. There are many other examples of how COVID has exposed the fault lines in Canada's piecemeal approach to sexual and reproductive health and rights and the ways in which access is linked to income, occupation, HIV status, geography, age, disability, race, family status, immigration status, among others. So when we talk about a recovery from uh, COVID, we don't wanna go back to normal because normal means a return to systems that only worked for a privileged few. We want new systems that recognize the full spectrum of sexual and reproductive health and rights for everyone as fundamental to the well-being of individuals, to communities, uh, to society, and for the realization of our human rights. And this means money, it means political will, it means meaningful consultation and participation of those most affected, means strong accountability mechanisms, commitment to transparency, an end to the criminalization of sex work and HIV non-disclosure, and um, most importantly, it means a dismantling of the discriminatory structures that are in place now that limit access uh, for all. And so this is what it means to leave no one behind. And, and Canada has an obligation to do this domestically, as well as within its international system. Thank you so much, Megan. You raised so many important points, and I really appreciate the focus you gave on inequality, multiple forms of discrimination, and also just on accessibility and how the COVID-19 pandemic has really exacerbated what we've known about who has access and privilege and accessing these really fundamental rights. Um, so thank you for that. And I'm gonna move now over to Mara. So Mara, SDG 13 on climate action is also under review this year. 
and the Biden administration has identified this issue among its top priorities. So tell us about your work on climate justice and feminist advocacy in the United States. What are you pushing for and what would you like to see more of? Thanks for that question, Spagme. I just first want to also start with a lot of gratitude and to say I'm really honored to be here. Um, I work with We Do, the Women's Environment and Development Organization, which is a global feminist advocacy organization working towards gender, environment, and climate justice. And like We Do being a part of the women's major group, much of our work is really in collective and in coalition. And I think that this is really critical in terms of thinking about um, how global justice demands and how global solidarity with feminists around the world drives our work and our priorities across the board and, and who our work is really accountable to. Um, so I think earlier this year, actually, Spagme, we were in conversation about what we wanted to see from the Biden administration in terms of climate action really early on um, in their term. And I cited a quote from a journalist that I really admire, um, Mary Heglar, and I think about this quote most days. Um, and she wrote, we live today in, in the age of crisis conglomeration. It's no longer useful or honest or even smart to look at any of them through a single lens. Um, and that quote really resonates with me. I think it resonates with a lot of feminists. Um, feminists are just so used to working at the intersection of crises. And, and I think feminist advocacy, feminist climate advocacy, too, is really rooted in that understanding first and foremost. So. Our work at We Do and in our collectives that are, are working on climate justice and feminist advocacy, we know that there is no addressing gender inequities or the climate crisis through that single lens. Um, their impacts intersect, and so the actions that we need to take to address them need to as well. Um, so when I call back to that conversation, Spagme, there were a few specific things that We Do had articulated wanting to see from Biden's administration. And it's safe to say that we're still pushing for those things and want to see more of them. Um, and I think many of those demands are also really shared um, across the global north and specifically with Canada as well. So we haven't seen the progress that we need to and that science and justice demand. Um, and our advocacy at, at We Do in the United States, um, but, is, but also reflected within the US-based coalition that we're really proud to be a part of, the Feminist Green New Deal Coalition, uh, which I'll speak more about in a little bit, really revolves around uh, these three core uh, buckets of, of asks, if you will. So first, really, um, our advocacy revolves around demanding that the Biden administration, but uh, also Canada, really heed grassroots feminist and black and indigenous leadership. So we know that climate solutions are plentiful, they are community centered, they are justice oriented and they really exist everywhere. We are not suffering from a lack of climate solutions. Uh, we're suffering from a lack of political will. Um, so, you know, from mutual aid networks to agroecology practices to collective resource sharing of many kinds, folks on the front lines of the climate crisis are and always have been at the forefront of solutions. So specifically in this moment, I'm thinking about, for example, heeding the leadership of Indigenous women and Two-Spirit-led resistance in Minnesota on Anishinaabe land um, that is telling the Biden administration to stop Line 3, which is a pipeline that is threatening their livelihoods and their ability to grow traditional and culturally critical food, wild rice, as well as infringing on, on treaty rights and indigenous sovereignty. Um, and Biden so far has, has allowed pipeline construction to continue, which is unacceptable and totally incompatible with an understanding that, that climate action matters to, to his administration. So feminist climate advocacy here means standing in, in total solidarity with those water protectors, um, and saying that there are no sacrifice zones here in the US, in North America, or anywhere else. Um, the second sort of bucket of advocacy, when you asked what feminist climate advocacy is really pushing for right now, I would say is, um, is rooted in, in the, the understanding that care work uh, and care infrastructure is climate work and is climate infrastructure. So we've seen Biden's administration so far, you know, really open real doors to, to big investments in care infrastructure, but we need to see stronger bridges in those investments to climate action. So we know, of course, um, as I'm sure also many of my panelists will touch on and is central to this really this whole panel, okay. 
hair work is is performed mostly by women and mostly women of color um, and it's life sustaining and life giving work uh, it's central to to the world that we need to transition to in order to address the climate crisis it's work that is low carbon it is community centered it's aimed at providing dignified healthy lives for all care jobs are green jobs and we really need to see that in our climate policy and in our climate action from uh, from Canada from the US and across the global north um, and third, what we'd really like to see and where our feminist climate advocacy is um, seeing a lot of um, momentum right now is, is around money and, and putting money where it matters. Uh, so needing to finance transformation. Um, and our feminist climate advocacy is, is pretty clear. We've got to shift away from the dominant economic model. We've got to divest from fossil fuels, from the military industrial complex, which includes in how it manifests in the police. Um, from all of these institutions that are really built on extraction from people uh, and from the planet. Uh, and I have a lot, lot more to say about climate finance and, and how polluters have to pay and what climate reparations from Canada and from the US looks like, but I'll, I'll hold off on that until our next section that I think looks specifically more at um, our role in global action and global justice, uh, where I think this piece on finance is really especially critical. So I'll, I'll just close here, Spagme, by saying, yeah, our feminist climate advocacy and what we really want to see from Canada and from the US really includes uh, broadly these three things, heating, frontline, frontline and black and indigenous feminist leadership, centering care uh, in our climate action and really focusing on financing transformation. Thanks. Thanks so much, Mara. As always, I really appreciate the foundational priority you give to intersectionality and coalition building in your work. It's truly inspiring and a great model for us to follow. Um, I also love what you said that there's no shortage of climate solutions. It's all about who's at the table, who needs to be listened to, and who's getting the financial support to really see their solutions be put into place. Um, and you're Discussion on care, I think, gives me a good leeway to move over to our next panelist, Beth. So Beth, SDG 8 on decent work and economic growth is also under review this year and central to those issues, as Mara highlighted in some of her remarks about climate, is a focus on care work and the care economy, which during the COVID-19 pandemic has become even more pressing and important for advocates to focus on. So given your focus on care, how is Canada prioritizing investment in care at the national and international levels, and where do you see areas for improvement? Thank you so much, Spock May, and thanks to We Do, ICRW, the Fundacion Women's Major Group for, for convening this really important discussion. One of the things that always strikes me about the discussions on feminist foreign policy that we've been involved in is the ongoing highlighting of the connections between the national, the domestic, and the international, and that's why I think this, this discussion is really important. I, I'd like to note that I am calling in from un unceded traditional Algonquin Anishinaabeg territory. This is um, something we uh, are, are wrestling with in Canada. I think that the, the global news has been very clear on the the discovery of unmarked graves of children at residential schools. And this is something that we will need to work on very intentionally, uh, very deliberately in the next while while going forward. And it's 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 um, an ongoing issue for those of us in Canada. I'd, I'd like you to people to think about what you did today before you turned on your computer, right? What, what did you give a child a bath? Did you prepare a meal? Did you sweep the, the floor? Did you, what did you do? All the things that were necessary to, to make us um, be able to function in the world. I, we all know the issues of the care economy very, very intimately in our, in our day to day lives, because it's something that we we run up against. And as has been mentioned, the, the pandemic has made these tasks much more visible as schools have closed and we've had to look after uh, kids. I think it even popped up in the in the conversation before we officially opened the 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 webinar today. We've we've seen how fundamental all this work is to making everything else else happen. We all know uh, women 
who have left the workforce um, in the last uh, 18 months because they can no longer manage to do all the work in their in their homes and as it relates to to and 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 then also work outside the home. Um, and I think that it's really important that we and we we we, we look at the whole scope of issues that it is the domestic work it's or you know we used to call before the reproductive work what families need to do in order to ensure that people can function in the world um but there's also the important element of the paid uh care workforce and i think those are some of the issues mara was highlighting in terms of these are green jobs these are um jobs that are, are going to be more in demand in, in Canada and the United States going forward, um, and that they're also potentially very, very green jobs. And it's important that we look at how they are being done right now by mostly racialized um, immigrant women or women with, with um, unsecure status. Um, we know that this work is not being hand, uh, is not managed equally. We know um, that women globally, even before the pandemic, performed over three quarters of the unpaid care work. It's not counted. It's often not not visible. Women also comp compose globally over seventy percent of the health and social care workers around the world. We know that um, daughters do more work than sons, we, so we see intergenerational impacts of this as well. Um, so what, but that's, that's, I guess that's all pre preamble in terms of what is Canada doing? Um, and as uh, Megan was saying, you know, there's, there's on the one hand and there's on, on the other hand as so often with Canada, but we do have, we did have two reasons to celebrate uh, recently in Canada. In our federal budget um, earlier this year, there was the announcement of $30 billion Canadian to build a national early learning and childcare program. This is something that Canadian feminists have been arguing for and pushing for and making the case for for decades. So even though it was a, it's, it's a really crucial government announcement, we saw this as a real um, achievement by feminist activism. Um, and then uh, uh, 10 days ago or so at the Generation Equality Forum, Canada announced uh, $100 million, again, Canadian out of our international assistance envelope to do global standalone care economy programming. This also is a result of, of advocacy. And we saw this as really important. This is a significant investment in, in, in moving forward on, on, on these issues. Um, what more could be done? We still need to improve the data on care. It's often invisible. It's not counted in, in our national accounts and our uh, different different types of statistical structure uh, structures. We talk about revaluing, recognizing, reducing, re redistributing care work, and we need to understand all the intersectional, uh, multifactorial uh, variables of who does this work and how it's how it's managed. And also, one of the thing we're, one of the things we're going to be watching for in Canada is how is this money, this hundred million uh, programmed? Will it reflect the kinds of priorities that have been identified by feminist activists in terms of funding more activism, um, flowing to, to local organizations, to grassroots groups, rather than being funded through multilateral channels? But we can talk about that later. Thank you so much, Beth. I really appreciate the way that you contextualized your remarks and the reminder that care is such an essential part of our everyday lives. And my congratulations to the Canadian feminist movement for all of the incredible policy wins that you've seen. And it's really inspiring for us to watch. And I look forward to seeing how you get more wins in the coming weeks and how this work on care progresses. So I'm going to move the conversation a little bit now to talk about SDG implementation at the local level. Penny, as a UN follower and a New Yorker, I'm so excited to have you on this panel to talk about New how New York City is implementing and reporting on the SDGs. We're really excited by and interested in the voluntary local review or VLR process and the localization of the 2030 agenda. So can you tell us more about the VLR and what you've learned about gender equality in New York City through that process? Yeah, absolutely. First of all, thank you so much for inviting me. It's a pleasure to, um, to be with all of you. Um, I know ICRW really well from my days um, when I used to run the Girls and Women's Program at the Clinton Global Initiative. So it's so good to be back 
amongst um, my people. <laughs> um, but you know, before I talk about the VLR, I want to give um, just some of the context, especially in this discussion on um, gender equitable recovery from the COVID-19 pandemic this time last year. Um, I think all of you remember New York City was the epicenter here for the US. And, you know, we have um, experienced a lot, learned a lot, and um, will hopefully uh, be course correcting to build back better because of what we've learned. Um, you know, one something that was very clear to us from the beginning last year with the COVID-19 pandemic was how it impacted um, very specific demographics more than others. Um, in our communities of color, for example, we saw higher infection rates and a disproportionate number of deaths. And our city um, has been working very aggressively to tackle these disparities. The pandemic without question had an, uh, an outsized impact, impact on women. Um, a recent survey by the nonprofit A Better Balance showed that in New York City, the pandemic forced 52% of women who provided care for children to cut back on paid working hours across the US. It's been reported that nearly 3 million women have dropped out of the labor force. So these are numbers that we all know, but you know, as a society too, we also were very aware that we cannot hope to achieve the global goals as they pertain to ending poverty, um, achieving good health or economic growth without the participation of women. Um, so we have been arguing um, that a gender equitable recovery to the COVID-19 pandemic is not an if, but it's a must. Um, from day one, um, back in 2014, Mayor de Blasio has been intentional about creating policies that place women in power and promote the participation of women in the workplace. Um, for much of our administration, the last two terms, more than 50% uh, of senior leadership were taken um, or, or were represented by women. And as a result, the city has enacted a series of, lo a series of local legislation that empowers women, which includes paid parental leave, one of the first in the country, an initiative I was able to benefit from when I had my son, um, the salary history ban, which prevents employers from asking prospective employees about their salary history, a longstanding practice that perpetuated the gender wage gap. And then of course, we are very proud of our pre-K for all, which not only provides free full day education for our city's four-year-olds, but benefits the nearly two thirds of mothers with young children in our city's labor force. And I'm you know, really proud to note that during the pandemic, the city leaned really heavily um, on women <laughs> to get us through the hardest, um, you know, hardest part of what we what we lived through. Um, Dr. Osiris Barbo led our city through the earliest and toughest months of the pandemic as head of the city's Department of Health and Mental Hygiene. She helped track the disease and provided guidance on how to keep us safe, including practicing social distancing and using face coverings under her leadership. New York City was able to triple our hospital bed capacity, secure critical medical personnel, as well as PPE and other resources. Now, when demographic data showed that our Black and Latinx communities were dying at rates nearly twice that of our white and Asian New Yorkers, um, you know, one of my colleagues, Deputy Mayor Melanie Herzog, stepped in to tackle those disparities. And under her leadership, the city identified 33 neighborhoods that had been hardest hit by the pandemic and we pri prioritized COVID testing um, in those areas. We also noticed that the inequalities persisted when it came to vaccine access and did the deputy mayor set up the vaccine command center. And I'm giving these examples to just really solidify how much um, leadership <laughs> reflects policies. Um, and so that is something we have been very intentional about um, in our leadership of, of New York City over the last two, um, two terms. Now to date, the city has administered more than nine and a half million vaccine doses and more than half of all adult New Yorkers are fully vaccinated. So this is all happening in a very specific context. And here at International Affairs, New York City is host to the largest diplomatic corps in the world, hence why there is an agency that I get to be a commissioner of. Um, but we have, really recognized you know since day one that the the priority for us should be working to exchange best practices between new yorkers and the international community it's not about um, identifying just the new ideas but rather what's working what can we replicate that we know that has worked out there um, and we have done that through using the lens of the sustainable development goals back in 2015 um, i asked my team to uh, map the synergies between the SDGs 
and our one NYC development agenda, which the mayor had um, released on Earth Day in 2015, because of um, our strong equity lens when we talked about and identified ways to address sustainability and resiliency, we actually had synergies with all of the SDGs. So we created a platform called Global Vision Urban Action, which allowed this exchanging of best practices. But with um, in 2018, we knew that we wanted to do more in terms of how um, cities and local governments um, could show up as active partners to member states and to the UN and international community. And so we modeled, um, we created the voluntary local review. We talked to a number of stakeholders who were very excited about this opportunity. We modeled the voluntary local review after the voluntary national review. Um, national governments are all invited to share where they are in achieving the SDGs with the UN. So we decided to do that as a city and in, during the high level political forum in 2018, um, we presented our first VLR on Helsinki, soon joined us and we had, um, you know, a little thing going on. Uh, we launched the New York City Declaration back um, during the 2019 UN General Assembly with two dozen cities. Um, I'm really proud to say that we have about 230 local governments and cities now that have committed to the voluntary local review through this declaration. And it's just shown the importance of, I think cities beyond borders, um, cities and local governments beyond borders, having this language and this framework of the SDGs um, to exchange best practices. And it really came to a head, quite honestly, I was shocked. Um, during COVID, um, we saw the numbers of cities and local governments wanting to participate increase. We had WhatsApp chains and a lot of connectivity amongst cities about, what is happening? How are you dealing with our, your aging population, your homeless population, and sharing that those ideas almost in real time? And so um, that has been sort of the the um, the, the uh, life, the short life of the voluntary local review. But I think it's been a, become a very powerful movement um, for cities and local governments to work with their national governments, um, but to to share their best policies at the at the international scale. Thank you so much, Penny. It's so interesting to hear about the collaboration and the sharing of best practices that was held between New York City and the international community and cities worldwide. Um, I also love how you pointed out how when you did apply the SDGs to New York City, you already discovered so many synergies and so many areas of connection, which provided a really promising framework to build upon. So I'm going to come back to each of our speakers now to talk a bit more globally. I think we've set a great domestic conversation and want to dig deeper on the second objective that I identified at the start of this conversation, which is for us to think about the role and positionality of the US and Canada and in international forums and in relation to countries in the global south. So coming back first to Verena, um, as the US government reengages in multilateral spaces like the UN, how is it approaching its position differently this time? How is it really grappling with these questions of history, power, and responsibility in advancing sustainable development? gender equality and human rights worldwide. Thanks for the question. And I think what it really what it really boils down to is how do you how do you re-engage to meet this moment, this particular fragile moment, knowing that it didn't happen overnight. So, you know, that, that there is a history that there are deep-seated inequities, including in our country, of course, that have led to this moment. So I talked earlier about but the vice president's linkage of gender equality and democracy and equity, and, and that was deliberate. I think promoting and protecting human rights and fundamental freedoms is a core value in our nation's democracy, which is, which is being attacked. It's under attack. Um, this attack on democracy itself is reflected and being pushed on by attacks on human rights, on gender equality, especially in the recent years. Um, particularly when it comes to a lot of the issues that we've just talked about from, from climate to SRHR, CSE, you name it. Um, they're sort of the perennial canaries in a coal mine and, and they, are, they have been singing for some time now. So um, the US, as, as we enter this administration, as we re-engage, the US is placing democracy and human rights at the center of our foreign policy. I can speak for, for the State Department at least because they are essential for peace and stability here everywhere. Um, this commitment is firm and grounded in our own experience uh, as a democracy, which is of course to say that we're imperfect to say the least, um, falling short 
of our own ideals sometimes, but striving always for a more inclusive, more respectful, more free country. Um, and so if I can say, um, if our policies have returned to a more stable position, um, we have had to, so it, the policy is a shift in administration, it's a shift and we're gonna have to think about how we maintain that shift. And in maintaining that shift, you have to think about process. Um, and so we really have had to think a lot about how we work with, especially in the UN context, because that was your question, how we look, work with our like-minded um, countries, but also advocates to push back on this attack and these attacks on human rights, on gender equality. Um, and so more coordination has to become the norm. Um, across all regional groups, ahead of, during, post negotiations for hot washes, that is all going to be critical. And we, we saw this and we engaged in this both during um, the CSW, the, the high level political declaration on HIV AIDS. Um, and we're, we're definitely looking consistently across all of the sort of different UN four that we're in, uh, uh, working across regions to fight for more progressive language, whether it comes to SRHR, CSE, SGBV, GBV, SOGI, adolescents, girls, all of these, all of these issues that are all canaries all together. Um, and this, this applies, of course, to all of the, the bodies um, in which we're engaging. Of course, many of you will have seen the Secretary Blinken announced in March that we are seeking election or re-election to the Human Rights Council for the 22-24 term. Um, we're thinking about this across these bodies and we're, we're, we're standing ready to lead the charge or one of several charges, I should say, at the third committee um, this upcoming fall. And we hope, of course, that we're uh, going to be counting on all of our allies, countries, governments, um, all of to, to advance some of these issues, the empowerment of all women and girls and all their diversity. We ha really have to be, we must isolate um, those attempting to roll back decades of progress. We, we owe that to, to women and girls. And if I can just maybe close on a, on a more personal note, I was really fortunate a number of years ago to lead the US government's development of both our policy position and then our negotiating stance um, when it came to goal five for the SDGs. And I'll admit um, that even as we emphasized and pushed for a shift and an emphasis from sort of creating a development agenda to creating a universal agenda. I was not prepared or maybe aware of just how critical that framing would be in the, in the sort of immediate years to come since the adoption of 2015. In 2015, although I'm sure all of, all of the advocates on the line probably were very much aware. <laughs> um, and so these SDGs, they, they are shared for by all of us for at least the next nine-ish years, at least. And so as this administration does its part to, to push forward in the next three, three and a half years, or maybe beyond, um, we know that this is a baton that's shared by all of these countries and with all of the advocates who are going to be um, ensuring, advocating, pushing us to make sure that we as governments live up to those goals. And so I think that that emphasis on the universality, that, that sort of more humble posture all of that, I think, is is a marked shift in how we're thinking about re-engaging, um, especially on the UN front. Thank you so much, Farina, especially for sharing the personal insights on your previous work and the lessons learned and priority that you give to this in your current day-to-day. -day. Um, I really appreciate that, so thank you. I also want to highlight what you just said about process and how process and strategy and how it's not just about the US working with like-minded governments and how that's important, but also working with advocates both before, during, and after the negotiation process. So thanks for your comments on that. I'm gonna go back to our three other thematic speakers. So coming back to Megan, you spoke about Canada's um, efforts on sexual and reproductive health and rights and what more needs to be done there. So looking internationally, research from the Guttmacher Institute had found that a 10% decline in sexual and reproductive health services in low and middle income countries due to reduced access in the COVID-19 pandemic could lead to 15 million unintended pregnancies, 28,000 maternal deaths, 168,000 newborn deaths, and 3.3 million unsafe abortions all within a year, which is really striking. So what role would you like to see Canada play internationally to prevent these trends and how can it act differently? 
Thanks, Bagme, for the question. And um, it's been really interesting to just hear all the different perspectives um, on this panel. And I really, I really do welcome the opportunity to link the the local, national, and international um, work and and provide a bit of or and encourage some self-reflection for Canada and US within de uh, development spaces. So um, so your question around uh, what role would you like to see Canada play internationally? I was thinking about what we have talked about already and and what that what that means for Canada in um, and also taking um, uh, Verena's uh, point there, thinking about um, you know a, a different uh, um, you know more humbled leadership position and what that looks like. Um, and because we know Canada has taken a leadership position on uh, SRHR globally over the last few years um, and has committed significant funds to back up this position. And as we heard from Beth, most recently at the Gender Generation Equality Forum, Canada has announced major investments in the care economy and, and has also announced support for feminist funding mechanisms to provide more and better funding. Um, and these are important and very welcome developments that we at Action Canada and the movements that we belong to, we wholeheartedly support and indeed we advocated very strongly for them. And we support them because they are attempting to address the root causes of poverty, ill health, discrimination, and gender inequality. And, and we know that by addressing root causes, communities are more resilient when crises like COVID-19 um, hit. Uh, however, just like in Canada, as I discussed in my previous intervention, crises I intensify the fault lines of systems um, and bad actors can take advantage of the chaos to repress dissent, spread disinformation, stigmatize certain groups, and push through harmful legislative and policy change. And we know that sexual and reproductive health and rights are almost always the first to be sacrificed in a crisis because they disproportionately impact women, girls, and marginalized people, all the people with the least power in every single country in the world. Um, and so to mitigate the negative impact of the crisis on sexual and reproductive health and rights, we have to work to support the building of these strong foundations that integrates the civil and political, as well as the economic, social, and cultural factors. I mean, those words are not chosen by accident. Those are the, the grouping of human rights of uh, civil, political, economic, social, and cultural. And often there's very much a false divide between the civil and political and the economic, social, and cultural. And we cannot continue to support this divide in the, the way that we conceptualize human rights, the way that we conceptualize sexual and reproductive rights. It's not tenable. And we cannot isolate sexual and reproductive health and rights from these wider factors because it's the very isolation is what makes it vulnerable in times of crisis and at the whim of different political leaders. And I would, I would offer um, the UN Human Rights Council's initiative on a human rights-based approach to preventable maternal mortality and morbidity as a good example of how you can support building the strong foundation because it recognizes that preventable maternal deaths, they're not the result of a lack of knowledge or science but are the result of successive human rights and system failures. And so to reduce preventable maternal deaths, we have to address these systemic failures. So to the, to the question of what I would like to see, what role I would like to see Canada playing at the global level, I offer two suggestions. Uh, the first is to invest at accountability mechanisms at local, national, regional, and international levels that support people in claiming their human rights and also duty bearers in fulfilling their obligations. We often think about accountability as a, as a blame, shame and blame kind of situation, but when accountability functions well, it becomes a process of review, learn, plan, and, and built into that is around reparations and justice. And this is all part of 
what, what is involved with um, accountability mechanisms. And as a, I wouldn't say as a side note, because it is quite critical to the whole infrastructure of human rights, I also have to look at the systemic underfunding of the human rights mechanisms within the UN system as a whole. It is reaching, I mean, even before COVID, you know, the, it's not sustainable what's happening at the UN Human Rights Council. And, and if our governments are serious about supporting uh, human rights and women's rights around the world, a key place for which the accountability, the global account accountability mechanisms are located, if that's not able to do its work, what does that say about the broader picture? And second, um, as a major donor of SRHR globally, Canada has to align its international assistance practices with its political commitments. We know that governments can be big, the bureaucracies are big and unwieldy, structures in which change can take a long time to manifest. However, while Canada is making bold announcements and how it will do things differently, its bureaucracy in some areas continues to use outdated funding models that were developed in a previous time and don't meet the needs of SRHR organizations and those working towards social justice in the countries that Canada provides support. And what's, what's more is these models, they also risk replicating and entrenching neo-colonial and racist international development practices that fracture civil society movements. And this was acutely uh, evident during COVID and it should act as a wake up call for us all. And we acknowledge and support Canada's role in advancing new feminist funding mechanisms. Um, and we're really excited by, by the opportunities that, that this presents. And also we urge Canada to take a long, hard look at its existing funding streams and models and to align them more closely with its policy commitments. And I have been so happy to hear all along this emphasis on process uh, from all of our different speakers. And I think that's, that's the overarching message I think for um, that I wanted to get across is um, in this piece, the process is critical to achieving the advancements that we're all fighting for. And that needs to be recognized, valued and, and implemented at all levels. Thanks. Thanks so much, Megan. You so clearly articulated your recommendations for Canada and its space in the international system. And you also shed light on a lot of key issues that are really important to the women's major group, which is the focus on systemic change and root causes and strong foundations in the way that you mentioned all of that. And um, also on the holistic implementation of the SDG agenda, you mentioned all of these issues are interlinked and that's exactly what we try to point out that the SDGs need to be implemented holistically and central to that is human rights, gender equality and all of the issues that you've highlighted. So thank you for your remarks. I'm going to shift back to Mara now. So Mara, the US is among the world's largest carbon emitters and polluters, but countries in the global south are suffering the worst of climate change impacts. How would you like to see the Global North position itself on climate and gender equality issues internationally to address these power differentials and have a meaningful impact? Thanks, Bogme. Um, it's been, yeah, it's been really incredible to listen to my co-panelists share how they're thinking about the challenges and opportunities around the SDGs and really making those local to global linkages. So just reiterating the gratitude of, of being here and learning from you all. So in terms of what I would like to see, um, a lot, a lot, a lot that would be different. So I think in terms of what we would like to see from the Global North to actually operate from a place of justice and repair uh, in recognizing its role in producing and driving the climate crisis and sustaining its unjust impacts by refusing to do much about it. One of the biggest pieces here is, is finance. Um, and this, when I say finance, this is a broad umbrella. This means the funding and resourcing for movement-led solutions, for adaptation, for resilience, things like loss and damage, climate reparations as defined and understood uh, and pushed for, for decades by lots of frontline activists leading this work. Um, and this finance piece was the third section of, of my previous remarks in terms of what we'd like to see 
from the from the US administration specifically, but the demands around climate finance really hold true and look similar across the board in the global north. Um, so for the US, um, the US really needs to pay its fair share to the rest of the world for, for the outsized role that we've played in the climate crisis. Um, and I can't say this enough times, this is a matter of, of justice and of repair. And I'd encourage folks to look up the, the US Fair Shares Nationally Determined Contribution resource that we do and many allied partners worked on earlier this year that outlines with really clear analysis and numbers and recommendations what kind of finance demands we want to see met from the US. In other words, it really answering what is our fair share of payment and resourcing um, based on our outsized role in causing this harm. Uh, and so that resource feels absolutely key to, to the continued advocacy, um, both in this administration and beyond. So doing our part really means at bare, bare minimum, the $8 billion already committed to the Green Climate Fund. Um, it means making the first and long overdue commitment to the Adaptation Fund. Um, but of course, this also, that's not even encompassing the broader shift that we need to see to actually divest from harm and invest in the social protections and care that we need to not only recover from the COVID-19 crisis, but also um, build the feminist future uh, that addresses the climate crisis that we need. So within the delivery of that finance, 100% uh, should be gender responsive. And we know that that money should directly support local women's rights organizations local feminist organizations um, and environmental and climate justice efforts both here in the US and in, in the countries most impacted uh, and experiencing the climate crisis right now. So this goes beyond the US. Last year, we do actually put together a full brief of recommendations for Canada's feminist climate, climate finance pledge, um, including connecting really its recommendations to the feminist foreign policy work in Canada, the international feminist assistance policy, to really give a blueprint for what transformative climate finance from Canada that would actually address gender inequality and, and the climate crisis in tandem, what that would look like. Um, and I'd encourage folks to go read that, but I would say top line, this really includes things like uh, investing in women's rights organizing, shifting substantive multilateral funding from development banks, towards the GCF, the Green Climate Fund, and the Adaptation Fund, uh, and using the lessons learned during COVID-19 around revaluing care to prioritize long-term feminist funding and, and a reconsideration of what you know, a climate investment means. Um, so from all the countries in the Global North, I want to see these kinds of recommendations adopted and, and actualized. Um, so I'll end also with a look forward on the horizon to COP26, the United Nations Conference of Parties in, in November of this year, when countries who are a party to the Paris Agreement will, will meet to ramp up ambition on global climate action and to assess the progress of, of the last few years. And this is really, I cannot emphasize enough, an opportunity in addition to following through on, on gender, on generation equality commitments, excuse me, for the Biden-Harris administration to, to actually show leadership on climate justice and gender justice, both from a finance and equity perspective in that space. So if the US and Canada and others mean business, um, that would be a key moment to really demonstrate so by acting on finance, acting on climate justice and acting on gender justice. Um, so that's what I would change. <laughs> Thanks, Bogme. Thanks so much, Mara. I love the framing of justice and repair and thank you for giving so many great tangible concrete recommendations on finance and how the Biden administration can move forward. Um, what you've mentioned about feminist movements gives me a great transition back to Beth as well. So Beth, coming off of the Generation Equality Forum, I wanna also ask you about feminist movements and the work of the Equality Fund. Fundamental to all the issues we've addressed today from SRHR to climate, care, COVID-19 and working with civil society organizations is investment in women's rights organizations and grassroots movements. So what role do you think the Global North should play in supporting feminist movements domestically and internationally and what recommendations do you have? 
Thanks so much, Spogme. And I think we have a couple of, of themes that we're, we're hearing echoing throughout the importance of root causes, strong foundations, the importance of process. And, and that's one of the issues that I think was really, really interesting in the, in the Generation Equality Forum discussions. It was clear across all the action coalitions and in the Compact on Women, Peace and Security and Humanitarian Action that funding has to shift more to feminist organizations women-led climate activists, women-led climate, uh, women-led peace building organizations, because these are the drivers of, of change. We're, we're, we have the anecdotal evidence, and we're now seeing more and more the, the actual um, cross-sectoral research that shows that when you see progressive changes, we can track back to strong feminist movements and organizations as being a key driver of that change. Started out and look, we had first the evidence on changes on gender-based violence, but we're getting more and more the evidence that when you start to see changes on, on land titling, so economic issues, when you're, it, it, you can track that to strong feminist mobilization. We certainly have lots of evidence in the peace and security field of when women's organizations are involved, you have more sustainable peace. So picking up on, on, on Verena's point about uh, uh, the link, it's, it's the links between democracy and, and gender equality, but I would take it one step forward that then you see that gender equality when you have a healthy, vibrant, well-funded feminist movement um, there as, as well. Um, and yet, we know the evidence, and I'm, I'm sure people on this call are very aware that the statistics on what percentage of philanthropy funding, what percentage of international development assistance funding going to women's rights organizations is absolutely a, infinitesimal. I think in the, the, in the latest report from the Association of Women's Rights and International Development, when they looked at not just the, the, the funding going to uh, women's rights organizations and gender equality institutions, where you actually can pare it down to the women's rights organizations, it's, um, what is it here? 0.13% of international assistance, right? So we have a lot of talk about gender equality and money dedicated to this, but it's not reaching the activists. It's not reaching those at the foundations, those doing that kind of work that will be so essential if we're going to see the change in this areas. And so this is one of the things that the Equality Fund Fund was established to do. We're a relatively new fund. We support uh, women's, women's uh, organizations, feminist organizations, LBTQ organizations, um, with an emphasis of groups that have been on the margins of previous funding. So looking um, to support young Indigenous women's organizations, um, organizations looking at this, that some of these nexus that we've been discussing of, of climate change and disability, groups that have not had access to traditional funds. Um, and that's, that's one of the really important elements that we were uh, established to, to try to, to solve for. One of the, the, the issues also that was discussed in, in Generation Equality Forum and is part of the ongoing feminist funding discussions is yes, we need an absolute increase in the quantity of funding, but we also have to look at the quality of funding. And that's, I'm picking up on, on some of the points that Megan was making, that we hear really strongly from feminist organizations that they need core support, they need flexible funding, they need multi-year funding. They don't want to spend all their time filling out forms, submitting timesheets, responding to log frames, doing all of this kind of, of uh, bureaucracy that takes away from from the work that they're doing. So it's about changing the quantity of the funding, but also changing the quality of, of that funding um, and how it's, how it's administered and what the strings, uh, the, the hoops that people have to go through to, to access it. Um, 
so I think this is a, a, a really important part and tied to that is the understanding of risk and what it means to, you know, how risky is it to fund these organizations? We hear this all the time. They're small. They don't have the capacities. And, and this is one thing that the Equality Fund and other women's funds are, are looking at is how do we support the capacities of these organizations? But the big question is also, what's the risk in not funding them? And I think we have to think about those questions and even in, in, in different forum that if we don't fund these organizations, um, will we be looking once again at the end of this 10 year period on the SDGs and saying, geez, it's too bad, you know, we had COVID, but, but we didn't get where we wanted to be. But if we actually do make these investments, um, we do stand a much greater chance of, 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 of achieving these goals. I think it's also related to, um, you know, the what can the global north do? I think it's also related to the points that were being made around human rights, that these organizations have to have this space to operate in. That when we see the closing of, of, of spaces, and we've seen it more in COVID, COVID being an excuse to crack down on organizations, especially we've seen it on LGBTQ organizations in many countries, um, that that is something that has to be loud and clear. Um, the pushback on the pushback, as it's called, how do we keep these spaces alive so organizations can, um, can function effectively? Um, also, uh, governments have a role to play in highlighting and giving roles and recognition to these organizations, inviting them to the spaces where decisions are being made, recognizing their expertise, paying for their expertise when it's when it's being asked for, making sure that they're part of the discussion and seen as credible uh, leadership voices on on key issues. Um, and I think one of the other things when we're talking about funding, just, just finally, is to fund these kind of movement building spaces of enabling these conversations, enabling different movements to connect and learn from each other. Uh, this is an area that we hope to, to look at at the, at the Equality Fund, but I think it's, it's come out in, in different conversations that these, this, the, the, the conversations at these different connection points are really, really important and activists need to be funded to have the conversations in these areas. Thanks so much, Beth. Really appreciate the points you raised about how the evidence is there, but oftentimes rhetoric is still not meeting action and what you mentioned about quantity and quality and how it's important to shift our framing, not just about how much we fund, but how exactly we are funding, who we're funding and how we're thinking about it. I'm going to go back to Penny for my last question. Um, so Penny, moving from local to global, you talked so much about best practices and sharing of ideas. So I'd love to hear more. How is the VLR movement growing and what recommendations do you have for other cities and advocates in other cities to take up this model effectively? Um, thanks for that question. And first, I just want to thank um, my fellow panelists, I, I, I haven't, I really haven't disagreed with a thing that's been said, which is um, both infuriating because especially around the financing, there is so much talk about gender equity and the numbers related to that are so, um, you know, dismissive. Um, I will say, you know, just from my perspective and, you know, the VLR stemmed, um, it was created because, you know, we, we spent four years within the Trump administration. There were, um, <laughs> you know, there, there, there was a time um, not too long ago um, where cities actively had a national, US cities had a national government abdicating their responsibility um, on basic things that were happening around us, not just around gender equity, but also climate. And, you know, part of the, the genesis for the voluntary local review was that we wanted to show the global community um, what where American values were at. Um, this is how we care as a as a major American city. This is what we think about these different SDGs. And I have to say, on this um, issue of, of gender equity and getting money to the issue, a lot of that activation also needs to start happening at the community local government. Everybody's doing really, really good work and we need to continue to try to get the, the big dollars from our national governments and the big institutions. But there's so much that can be done locally that I think was one of the benefits, that's a bad word, just one of the, I don't know, 
things that rose to the top around the Trump administration is just how much our system um, empowers local governments and cities, right? Whether it's around policing, whether it's around, you know, ex, you know, policies around climate or gender equity, we have to push for that to happen from everything from school board to city council, like what is being taught in our schools. That's a kind of, I think, activation we really saw on some issues, probably not gender equity as much over the last um, four or five years. And so I just would just encourage, and part of the reason the Voluntary Local Review gives us that opportunity is to have those conversations and that connectivity. So when we created the VLR, we purposely kept the barrier for entry extremely low because it's not just um, New York City or American cities, but we wanted cities around the world um, depend, you know, irrespective of their resources and their capacity or size to participate in this exercise of that turned into a movement of showcasing how much we were getting done for our communities. Um, and so because that barrier for entry is low, there are so many ways, um, I think, for cities throughout US and Canada to enter the conversation. We have a lot of information on our um, on our website, uh, Mayor's Office for International Affairs, but we have partners like UN Habitat, UN DESA, um, the Brookings Institute that are creating opportunities and workshops and you know sort of data algorithms to um, to track everything that is being achieved all, you know, all together. So there's, I think everybody, there's an entry point there, but I do think for the activists that are listening, um, it is so important to activate around the money and the change at the local level too. There is so much, especially I'm going to speak for the U.S., that we can actually get done. Um, and so I would just encourage that shift um, in, in thinking about activating. Thank you so much, Penny, for laying that out. And really useful to hear about the different the openness to entry and how to make this more and more accessible process for all. So thank you all for that conversation. I've, I've learned so much in the past hour and a half, and I have about 10 minutes or so for Q&A from the audience. So we're compiling questions on the back end, and if others have more, please feel free to add them to the chat or to the Q&A panel. Um, and I'm going to start with one question, which um, I think this one is coming more to you, Penny, but I'll leave the floor open for others if they wish to answer or offer their perspectives from their level of engagement. But the question is, how do we encourage ownership over achieving the SDGs, especially at local levels, particularly when it may come to navigating elections or voter bases or different barriers that come up at the city level? Um, I want to combine that also with a question on civil society participation. And when we talk about the VNRs, a huge priority for us is how do we really engage civil society advocates in this process? So how are you doing that in New York City through the VLR process? Yeah, and even before the VLR, uh, when we created the Global Vision Urban Action Programming, which was taking the SDGs and saying, this is what we're doing in New York City, we're using this language, let's bring the experts in to exchange best practices. We at the same time recognize there's one thing about getting experts and sanitation talking to each other, but we get paid by New York City taxpayers. So why am I doing this? Why is this important for you? And so that was really a core um, group, you know, in terms of civil society activation um, that we focused on. And we really did it with a focus on young people. Um, so we created a program called New York City Junior Ambassadors, which is taking the like the 13 to 14 year old age group, um, inviting them to essentially come be part of a competition where their educators um, you know, assign SDGs or they select SDGs, they integrate it into their curriculum. But part of the, the, the process of this is getting young people to see themselves as part of a global movement, but recognizing the work that needs to be done and then COVID really brought that home is in their neighborhood, right? And so many of our like thousands of junior ambassadors over the last five years choose gender equity, choose climate, they choose you know, domestic violence, things that they are actively um, experiencing in their communities. And I think it's that connection that we, we aren't doing enough in terms of making the SDGs relevant in everyday life. Um, you know, I only we only have so much capacity and resources, and we really saw um, that young people were a really strategic way of, of doing that because you get them activated, they're doing their work, they're going home and talking to their parents about it. And, you know, a lot of people think, well, New York City should do this because we're New York City and we're host to the you know, diplomatic corps. Um, there is that, but the reality is this is relevant everywhere. And part of the reason I say that is when we first started um, 
um, sort of promoting marketing the junior ambassador program, I went to Staten Island and talked to a couple of hundred seventh and eighth graders and their principal was telling me that about 70% of his students hadn't left the island of Staten Island. The UN could be in another country for all it mattered to them, right? And it was it was our job as government to do this work, um, to get them activated, to create that connection um, and purpose. And I do think that is one of the ways that like local governments should be working with civil society. Thank you so much. That's your, the answer to your question actually, the answer to my question actually leads into my next question to the other panelists. So I wanna ask the rest of you all also about young people. One of the questions that came through um, the chat was about the importance of engaging marginalized groups in meaningful ways in decision-making. And oftentimes we see a tokenization of young advocates and young people. So how can young advocates be more meaningfully engaged throughout the work that you all do, rather than be treated as uh, window dressing, as is quoted in the question as we continue to see today? So whoever wants to take that up, please feel free. I can, I can start. <clears throat> um, I think we've had some great discussion already about process. And, and I suppose my first uh, point would be to engage young advocates at the beginning of the process, like you do all of the other stakeholders that are involved. I think part of the, the, the what happens around the tokenization of, of young advocates is because they're brought in at the end after all the decisions have been made and um and yeah are are tokenized so so my first my first point is real emphasis on process and making sure that young people are involved in the conception the design and the development of, of policies programs advocacy strategies all of those kinds of things and then my second point is to listen to young people it's not like young people don't have ideas or um have great things to say or lots to contribute um I, I my second second point is, is listen to what young people are telling telling them um and and i'm sure my my panelists have lots of other great ideas but but i don't think you can go wrong with process and listening yeah I'll just jump oh go ahead beth go ahead mara okay thank you i'll just make it very quick i was just going to say you know as as someone who um also sort of cut my teeth in organizing for the first time in in climate activism i think the role that youth and the role that youth movements play in particular in terms of our response to the climate crisis is a really fantastic example of the ways that um the youth movements are really driving action and are driving a lot of the momentum around seeing substantive policy changes um, and are, are often tokenized and, and go un, under resourced uh, for the work that they're doing. So I think one resource I would just point folks to who are who are interested in sort of thinking about what are what are the comprehensive like youth led demands around process changes like Megan was just speaking to um, is there was a really incredible resource just put out in the context of Generation Equality Forum that is the Youth Manifesto, the Young Feminist Manifesto, um, which is like, I can't do it justice, but it's a 30 page document that essentially includes a ton of recommendations around, you know, the resourcing of young feminist movements and individuals who are contributing their time and labor into processes, things around, um, you know, what what real consultation looks like, what uh, intersectional youth centered approaches look like, what disconnect between youth bodies and sort of top down hierarchical structures that are often asking youth to sort of come in and um, in an uncompensated way share their time, perspective, experiences, et cetera. So this resource I would say is like a, found, a foundational anchor for folks to think through, not only in terms of Jeff, but also just all of the spaces in which um, youth are so often asked to come uh, share their voices, but are not necessarily heard. So I would say in the climate space, that's something that uh, the climate movement is particularly guilty of and is, is thinking about and, and working through. And I think see, we're seeing some real transformation around, but is uh, a feminist wide movement um, concern. 
excellent points from Megan and, and Mara. I was going to highlight the Feminist Manifesto as well. And just to pick up on one of the points in there right, on, on the resourcing, um, that one of the things that many of these feminists said in the lead up to, to, to the Generation Equality Forum is that they, they are not financed. Um, they're doing this as volunteers, many of them. And I do think actually it relates to some of the other things we talked about in terms of, of the care economy. There was a recent book published, which is excellent from by a number of Australian researchers on the care economy and the women peace and security agenda, noting how much of this work is being done as volunteers and almost an, an extension of the unpaid, unrecognized work, unvalued formally work that goes on. Um, and so I think that this is a, a really important work um, uh, element in this question as well, especially when many young women's organizations take different forms. They often aren't registered. So many of the restrictions that are being put on uh, you know, you have to have three years of registered audits, or you have to have this, a lot of these organizations don't fit into the previously thought of boxes of who a reliable um, program uh, or recipient of, of official funding is. So lots of really good questions are being are being raised about about moving beyond the, the tokenism of, of this participation. Thank you all so much. I'm afraid we're at time, so I want to respect everybody's time today. But thank you all for your generosity, for sharing the resources in the chat, for your thoughtful responses to these questions. It's been such a great conversation. Um, I also want to say that, if anything, I hope that this conversation piques interest for other groups working on gender and sustainable development to engage with the women's major group. As I said in the beginning, I'm a North America organizing partner. so. If any folks are interested, we are eager to expand the scope of our analysis to broaden our engagement with other groups to bring others front and center. So I'm dropping my email in the chat, please feel free to reach out. But again, thank you all so much to my panelists. I know that it has been a really busy month between HLPF and the Generation Equality Forum. So a reminder to enjoy the rest of the week and the events this week, but take the time you need to rest afterwards. So. Thank you all again, really appreciate your time today and hope to have more conversations soon.